Welcome to Red Shirt Day at the Theology Podcast. <laughs> yeah, we always coordinate or wear. Uh, if you're not on uh, 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 YouTube right now or Spotify and you can't see us, well, your just imagination will just have to fill in the gap. But uh, we are all wearing red today. Anyway, I'm C.R. Wiley. I'm a pastor. I serve a church in the Pacific Northwest, and I've written a number of things. My latest book is In the House of Tom Bombadil, and I'm an editor, senior editor at Touchstone Magazine. All right, Tom. I'm Tom Price. I teach theology and uh, Christian ethics. One of the places is Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary. All right. So, Glenn, go ahead and take it away. It's your show, so just take us right into it. I'm Glenn Sunshine. I'm a senior fellow at the Colson Center for Christian Worldview, Ministry Associated Reflections Ministries. I run a ministry called Every Square Inch Ministries, and I'm a retired history professor. Um, our topic today, I, I wanted to jump off of a quote from Lewis, uh, C.S. Lewis, that um, I found really interesting, and uh, I'm going to be also working off of uh, Holly Ordway here. Um, Lewis said at one point that reason is the natural organ of understanding, but imagination is the organ of meaning. And I thought it would be kind of interesting to unpack that. Uh, I've made an argument at a, a couple of places where I've said that I believe that right now what we need is a new apologetic uh, built around imagination and beauty much more than around the sort of uh, traditional ways apologetics has been done. And it turns out that um, since I reached that conclusion, <clears throat> I found out that there's an entire <laughs> yeah. school of imaginative apologetics. Yeah. And Holly Ordway is a, a good representative of that. Yeah. And so I thought it might be worthwhile to explore the idea of, well, what is imagination? Why is it important? And how does it fit in with apologetics and the Christian faith? Mm -hmm. That's great a lot stuff. Of people, a lot of people think of imagination almost entirely in terms of, uh, you know, fantasy, things that are completely made up or something like that. Um, but Lewis obviously didn't. So what, what does he mean by imagination? Well, historically, the word imagination simply referred to our capacity to create images in our mind. So that's a rather basic definition. But as soon as you say that, uh, you begin to realize that imagination is really active pretty much all the time. You know, and, your inner, and your inner John Calvin goes off. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. All right. So that that that's another question that we're going to have to talk about. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what do we mean? Well, why don't we start there? What do we mean by images? Yeah. Um, it turns out that the word can actually translate two different Greek words. Uh, one of which is, um, I think. Well, I think the Latin one is idolon but it comes from the Greek word, uh, which means either a mirror, potentially, I think the Latin is mirror, uh, or it can mean an idol. Mm -hmm. I might have that backwards, Greek and Latin there. Um, but the other word is icon. And, uh, you know, an icon is an image, an idol is an image. One of them... And by the way, a human being a is of, an image. A human being is an image too. Right. And the Greek word there used in Genesis 1 is icon. So one of them is kind of a legitimate thing. Human beings are icons of God. Mm -hmm. uh, but an idol is something else. So we've, we've, got a, we, you know, we've got a problem on what we mean by images here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can't help but, uh, you know, in my mind, go to Plato and his suspicions when it comes to images that human beings make. This, by the way, is, is something that might catch some of our listeners by surprise, particularly those who have a strong uh, sort of, re, you know, revulsion for Greek philosophy. <laughs> hmm. But uh, we probably screened those people out a long time ago. But, <laughs> but you know, in, in Plato's uh, works, you know, Socrates talks about a kind of, uh, movement away from the ultimately real 
And human art, in other words, visual art, is as far away as you can get from what is ultimately real. So in the Platonic way of thinking originally, uh, you uh, have the, what is ultimately real, of course, in a Christian framework, that'd be God. Then you have his icon in the world, which is us. And then you have what we make, which is in, always in some sense uh, so far distant from the ultimately real that's actually misleading. So there's a kind of suspicion within Platonic thought of visual images that parallel some of the, and this is again, kind of an interesting phenomenon you, or, or interesting, uh, it, it may, it's a coincidence, maybe I, I suspect it's more than a coincidence. Some of our more, um, iconoclastic reformed people who often, uh, recoil from and smash the image of Plato <laughs> are actually in agreement with him on this point. And yeah, yeah. I think uh, maybe, maybe a good thing to add here before Glenn takes off. Cause I know he's ready, <laughs> ready with the content. Right, right. Um, it there, you know, of course the, you know, I'm sure Glenn's going to be going here is of course the incarnation is what changes the whole game. And that's what changes the whole worldview game for Christianity and its relationship to everything else. Um, but one of the things you also have coming out of, of course, the biblical and the Hebraic, the, the early types of iconoclasm is the fact that the theophantic character of creation, the fact that it radiates through its creaturely distinctions, the glory of God in its own way, has been filtered and broken and entered into uh, an interpretation of unreality. So therefore, we can't read the creation or our own image the right way. So therefore, there's a suspect, and that's why the incarnation is going to come be the proper image of God back and become the source of bringing all that back. So, so there, was, there is always a healthy suspicion, um, even in the kind of the biblical mindset without Plato, but the fact that matter is good in God's creation that manifests his goodness is going to change the whole game for how imagination works in, in Christian thing. Yeah, we, we also have to take it a little bit further here in the sense that an image is not necessarily a picture. Mm -hmm. So human beings made in the image of God, the imago Dei, we we are not a physical representation of God. Yeah. So images, in, in the sense that the word imagination is talking about, images refer to more than just visual images. There are other ways of imaging beside the visual. Yeah. And that's critical to understand here when, when Lewis is talking about the imagination as the organ of meaning. That's really foundational because it isn't just our ability to create pictures in our mind, but it is our ability. Well, uh, Bonaventure, for example, mm -hmm. talks about the imagination as being the thing that, well, stores images. And by that, he means it stores our memories. Right. Our memories themselves are images in this sense of the word. And, I, and you know, my guess is that if I were to give a visual cue to you, to any of our, our listeners, you would probably be able to create a visual image um, you know, the classic example is don't think of a pink monkey. And as soon as you do that, a pink <laughs> monkey shows up in your mind. Right. Um, you know, but, but, um, why you know, did if you I do talk that, about Glenn? Why, why, why am I having to think about pink monkeys? I have pink monkeys jumping. <laughs> yeah. So, so, um, you know, but, but if I, you know, if I ask you to uh, think about an apple, you're going to get an image in your mind. Okay, so, so there are visual images, but where does that visual image come from? It is drawn out of our memory mm -hmm. of our sensory experiences of apples. Okay. So that's one of the roles of imagination. What it does is it takes our, you know, it, it stores the sense data, but it goes a step further than that, according to Bonaventure. Yeah. Uh, according to Bonaventure, your imagination is also the thing that mediates between our sensory experience and our reason. 
In other words, in order for our sensory experience to actually become something that our reason can work with, that it can use, it has to be mediated through our imagination. So maybe the best way to think about this is a child, an infant, um, who we know babies newborn babies have certain things that are pre-programmed into them to recognize. They will respond to um, simple diagrams of faces, okay, right away. So, so the idea, the, the face is sort of pre-programmed into the child before the child is even born. But the baby has to learn through experience that this particular face is mom, this is dad, this is grandpa, me, Uh, this is grandma, Um, all of these things. And the way it does that is wavelengths come into the eye. They hit the retina. They move to the brain. And the baby has to understand what these visual perceptions are, what they mean, and it has to associate those perceptions with specific individuals. And that process of association is part of the role of the imagination. So let, let me just stop here because uh, immediately, because of the, the way you went about this, using a kind of empirical description that is informed by contemporary science, um, instead of, say, uh, you know, the guesswork that, uh, you know, Bonaventure would have been engaged in. Uh, it reminds me of Kant. Um, so, and it also reminds me of how computers work because you mentioned uh, programmed, pre-programmed. So mm-hmm. like, like what, one of the things that was uh, really kind of a helpful analogy for me when I was trying to understand Kant, uh, because he's, you know, generally difficult to understand for for newbies you know you can't understand Kant (laughs) even the imagination doesn't help (laughs) any German scholar it's all of them yeah they're all about trying to be very uh abstruse I guess but anyway uh (laughs) what what you have with a computer is you have an operating system which is essentially invisible to the user Mm -hmm. but uh makes it possible to input and store data uh, and work uh, productively. Uh, if there's no operating system, you can sit at your computer all day and type in all kinds of, you know, things, and nothing uh, is stored. Uh, it's just as chaos. You know, you just got bits and stuff. You've got a sorting mechanism, and that sorting mechanism is the operating system. So, uh, people who remember Windows uh, and kind of the breakthrough Windows, what uh, you know, brought to the world of computers that were not Apple. So before that, we had DOS, which meant that everybody had to be at least a little bit computer literate. And that's why so few people uh, bought computers in those days. <laughs> and and then, the, then Windows was created, and Windows was the image. In other words, you, you open a window, and you, it, it helps you to see. Uh, and you had, a, you had a visual interface. But that indiv- visual interface was the operating system. And it made it possible to store data, memories. Uh, memory was accessible because of this. Uh, and so there's an interesting interplay. Now, the problem, of course, uh, when it comes to uh, reality, is it just in our heads? Is our, We talk about an operating system that just works in our heads. That's Kantian, uh, sort of the Kantian understanding of knowledge is that we're kind of stuck in our heads. Okay. Uh, or now, are we tapping into something larger than ourselves? Okay. Now, I'm, I'm actually going to back you up uh, a bit here because don't underestimate the medieval theologians well, um, yeah, in, in terms of their the sophistication of their understanding of what's going on in the world. Uh, medieval Glenn, scholars— Glenn, re- Glenn, really quick, because I think you could, I think I have a point that that you can actually complement much better by saying that same point after I say it, and I'll show okay. you why. Because what happened when Lewis comes around is you're already dealing with a fragmenting of something that was richly held together in the medieval world. 
And what you have going on in England in particular is the lingering domain, especially in the hard sciences of the Enlightenment, limiting things to a hard rationalism or a hard empiricism that has led to skepticism, ultimately, of whether we can really know things in a Humean sense, even empirically. So you still had positivism, um, which really tried to posit anything you can't know through experience or or you know, or something purely a pure reason, um, you can't know at all. But pure reason could never really end up touching the world. So you had a skepticism growing in rationalism. And then in Germany, the continental philosophers, they saw the dead end that that hard enlightenment was going. So they wanted to retrieve things that were left out of hard rationalism and hard empiricism, things like imagination, things like gefühl, thing, you know, feeling, um, you know, feeling of absolute dependence. All the romantic line comes to make up for that gap that's missing. Lewis's brilliance is he's connected to a medieval world that recognizes there is something that can hold those together the right way. And that's what Glenn's going to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, but I'm, I'm going to get there uh, by <laughs> backing up yet another step. Um, <laughs> It, it's really interesting when you look at medieval science, which is not really an oxymoron. Um, <laughs> when, when you look at what they were doing, they were really obsessed with optics. Okay. They were really, really interested in optics. They were pretty good with statics and physics. Um, otherwise, the cathedrals wouldn't have stood up. But um, they did a lot of work with optics. I mean, Roger Bacon, 13th century uh, English Franciscan, actually broke white light into a spectrum 500 years or so before Newton. He did it with a drop of water, hmm. okay, rather than a prism. Why, why were they obsessed with optics? Well, because optics is the branch of physics that is most directly connected to perception and therefore to epistemology, hmm. to knowledge. So they were doing a lot of work trying to figure out how light works, how the eye works, because, well, that's part of the reason has to do with its connection with epistemology. Part of the reason has to do with, um, well, with the creation. Light was the, according to uh, Gross test, light was the first object of creation. Yeah. Um, and uh, scripture talks about uh, Christ is, or the word being the light that enlightens every man. So th they saw light as being the thing that is, in a sense, an emanation of God, not quite literally, but mm -hmm. that is most that most directly reflects who God is. So there's a theological as well as an epistemological significance to light. And they spent a lot of time studying it. Mm -hmm. And they were really interested in issues of perception yeah. because of its connection to epistemology. Yeah. And what Bonaventure is doing here is he is saying that our sense perceptions, which are, well, they're empirical, but our sense perceptions are filtered through our imagination to create, to use modern terminology, to create the data that reason then can use. It's our imagination that turns our sense perception into memory. Our memory becomes the storehouse that reason draws from. Yeah. Now, you, you, you can see this again um, in, um, well, one of the examples Holly Ordway uses is writing. Mm -hmm. What you have in writing is a set of squiggles on a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. What you have to do is take those squiggles and determine what they mean. But the way you do this is through your imagination. Your imagination, the, the use of images here, the creation of images and all of those sorts of things, is what translates writing to words. And so the imagination is fundamental at that level. Same thing actually applies to hearing, which she also points out. What you're hearing right now is a set of vibrations in the air that are causing your eardrum to vibrate, which moves the hammer, uh, you know, the, all, you know, all of the uh, the bones in the inner ear, which translates it to nerve impulses, which go into your brain, which then translates it. That is also an act of imagination. And, and there is, a, I think, because of the rich view of creation that we're dealing with in that picture, you're dealing with something that theologians will have to call, call the serp 
you know, superfluidity, <laughs> um, superfluous <laughs> um, nature of, of reality. And therefore, imagination is that tool for getting a hold of that, which means a creaturely thing is not merely just the surface of its material manifestation. Its material manifestation is connected to a depth of reality that show it a creature and owing everything it does to God. And therefore, it is a theophany. It is something that light radiates out of when it's related to the right way. And that radiation of light is what is actually penetrating. And this is why Bonaventure's favorite language uh, or favorite passage, isn't it, the, from James, that from the Father of lights comes every true and perfect thing. And those perfections, if you will, are part of what the imagination is getting a hold of, the, the way in which you have manifestations in concrete material forms, if you will, to borrow some, some uh, Aristotelian <laughs> language and Platonic, but in a way that there is radiating from it something more than its surface. And yeah, yeah, this, sense this, perception this, gets a hold of the surface, but it does not by itself be able to, to apprehend, if you will, or get a hold of the rest of it. And yeah, so the, this is where you're talking about our fuller natures. And this is why Lewis was attracted to a fuller anthropology and view of the human that earlier Christianity and even early and pagan thinkers had, because they understood that we're not just angels or just apes, that we are holistically different, and therefore something more than rationalism or empiricism is going to be required for us to know and understand and get a hold of the richness of meaning that creation has been endowed with prior to our attempts to edit it or re-signify it. So this, this idea of the superfluous, su superfluidity, I guess maybe that's the way to say it, uh, it's one of the real problems for atheism because it, it doesn't know how to uh, work with it um, because it's it, everything is uh, tightly uh, efficient and uh, fully um, understood uh, through the surfaces, as you noted. The problem is, is that human beings are the most overcompensated evolutionary uh, in a sort of product, you know, let's, let's just for the sake of argument, for the sake of argument, pretend that, uh, Darwinism is explaining things. Uh, the problem is this, you know, uh, we are way overcompensated. I mean, there are, we can do things that no other creature can do. And, uh, we're self-conscious in a way that no other self uh, creature is self-conscious. So this particular problem is something that people like Daniel Dennett just write off as a, as illusory. You know, it's almost like they suddenly become Buddhists or Hindus at that point, you know. Yeah. And, um, but that's the part of our lives that's the most precious. <laughs> 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 you know, we're not just organisms, you know, meat machines, as Marvin Minsky says. But, you know, the, this is the part of ourselves that we, we, we try to preserve and cherish. And that's just why things like you know, Alzheimer's disease are so, uh, so terrifying to us, at least to me, you know, that's the part, you know, I, I don't want to just continue to exist. as just a, a lump of, of matter that's being nourished by people are pumping stuff into me. Uh, okay. and I'm not able to actually know anything that's going on around me. Um, that's not an, that's not a statement that's intended to endorse euthanasia. I'm just saying, yeah. you know, which is another show. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, yeah, this is, this, those, those are great observations, Tom. Yeah. So the, the bottom line here is that reason cannot deal with raw sensory perception. It has to be filtered through something. And the thing that it is filtered through is our imagination. I mean, if you, if you just think for a moment about language, uh, Paul talks about uh, there are many languages in the world and none of them are without what? Meaning. But if you don't know the meaning, the, the, it, it's just sound in the air. So how do you get to the meaning? Well, how do you learn a language? It's not really a process of reason. Reason may help you along the way, but reason only helps you along the way after you've had a certain amount of understanding of meaning. You can then reason your way to additional things about how the language works. 
So in English, you typically make a plural by adding an S. How do you learn that? Well, you get enough words where the plural is made with an S, and then you suddenly say, wait a minute, that's how you make a plural. Yeah. And then you run into children. Yeah. But, you know, but but again, this is is the role of imagination is to give you that basic raw material to work with. So just a quick thought, uh, just to kind of put a framework with the, w- around this that that I, it's helpful for me. Maybe you guys won't agree, but when I think about the, the classifications uh, w- with regard to reason, you know, historically there's ratio, which is what we've been talking about, and then there's intellectus, which is more capacious and more receptive. So ratio, you know, takes data, <clears throat> works with it, tries to make sense of things. Whereas intellectus receives, and this is where I think imagination is employed. So it's a kind of reason, but not not in the sense that most modern people think. It's not as though imagination is irrational. That's what I'm getting at. I, I think that people think, well, if reason uh, or imagination is not uh, reasoned, then it's just kind of whimsy or uh, illusory or uh, an act of the will. Whereas the older view, uh, you know, as Tom was noting, is more capacious and keeps it all together. And so when I think about like the Lagos, everything came into being through the Lagos, including the imagination. Yeah, I think I think you uh, that point, and Glenn has talked about this on on other shows when he talks about the the creation grounded in the Logos, the word. That word for classic theology, especially Augustine, will be such that what happens with creation, right, is that it is ordered, but it's ordered meaningfully, right? The ordering is actually the the meaningfulness of it, being formed, fashioned, and oriented towards the light that is it's it's the source of what it is and, and meaning of it. And so what happens is, creation comes endowed with meaning. Look at the Genesis ordering of things. If you rip that, the, the, the orderings of Genesis out with family, male, female, and all the rest, which we're trying to fight against, we are ripping our reason and from that set of meanings that are fundamental to all intelligibility. And so what do we have with the postmodern chaos when it rejects any kind of essences and boundaries is is meaninglessness. And so the even the projection of meaning is having to borrow from a meaningful world to create meaning even though it rejects meaning and it isn't governed by it and that's what creates its own its own monster. And so imagination um is that part interconnected with the reason or, or you could say imagination is just a fuller sense of what real reason is, right? Real reason has the kind of things we typically associate with reason, but it's fuller. It's bound up with meaning that is endowed in the very nature of creation, but has been eclipsed by the fall and now is being opened up to us again in light of the incarnation. Now, for most of us, I suspect, when we talk about imagination, we're not talking about it at this kind of a level. Yeah. <laughs> but I think it's important to start here because, again, Lewis's argument is that the imagination is the organ of meaning. And we've got to start with meaning just at the very basic level of what do words mean? You know, what what do the things around us mean? But um, But meaning goes obviously beyond that. Uh, you know, we can talk about the meaning of life or better in the, in, for our purposes, the meaning of a story um, or, well, the meaning of the world. You know, the the vision of the world is sacramental, which is a whole different subject. Yeah. Um, so wh- where this shows up in Lewis's life is he would read these stories um, that, you know, he talks about this um, in Surprised by Joy and elsewhere. He would read these stories in which he would see things like sacrifice and, and dying and rising gods and all of those kinds of things. And he found himself really seriously attracted to these things. There was something about it that resonated that was deeply meaningful to him. 
This, and what this, I'd, I, like, I'd, like to, I'd like to pause there, if you don't mind, Glenn. Sure. Just think a little bit about what you said. There are people that I know who, when they discover that there are similarities to the Bible's sort of content, in other words, sacrifice or even creation accounts or whatever, they're unnerved. <laughs> in other words, if, they, if, if it's not in the Bible, it must ipso facto be completely wrong, like saying the sky is purple or the sky is orange when it's clearly blue. In other words, um, they they don't have a sense of truth being um, somehow uh, present in anything except the Bible. Um, so, and then even the idea of a partial truth uh, uh, offends them. Um, and so what they'll do is uh, they'll try to figure out some way to explain these literary uh, similarities uh, by saying, well, they must have heard Moses or they must have <laughs> yeah, read the yeah. Bible somewhere. Well, that's an early. Like, <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm, getting, what I'm getting at. Yeah. But but if we have a high view of creation and the creation speaks, this is the problem. We don't have a high view of creation. Yeah. Uh, many contemporary evangelicals have a very low view of creation. They have a, a, a view of creation that's more in keeping with Richard Dawkins than yeah. Bonaventure. Yeah. Right. Well, the, and I think one of their their fears is that if you if you allow for creation to have anything about it that is good, it isn't fallen, and therefore can somehow be a cooperative element that allows one to merit. I think there's usually driven by this kind of Gnostic interpretation of re redemption. I mean, I've even heard figures, arguably, say figures like Gordon Clark would even push evil back up into God in the creation of evil being because they need to make total depravity destroy the goodness of the being of the creature that is fallen. And see, this is one of the things is that the fallen world, though it eclipses and deforms and depraves th the creation, it does not take away the goodness of the createdness of the creation. Right. That's why we're not going out saying abortion is a great thing. Get rid of all the fallen human creatures. Right. You're you're recognizing that the created goodness of human life and God's willing it to be and sustaining it in being is something that can't be eradicated. And guess what? It pokes its holes through all the fallenness, not to cooperate with grace, but that our sin cannot eradicate the gift. We have to rebel against it. We can't, we can't outrun it. And it's that radiant, radiance that comes through all over the place where God's light shines on the good and the bad and shines through it too. <laughs> you know, I had somebody attack me for including uh, Banerjee in 32 Christians Who Changed Their World. Banerjee was an Indian Christian who, among other things, made the argument that Christianity fulfilled Hinduism. <laughs> Interesting. That is to say that all of the things that Hinduism was grasping at uh, are actually found in the gospel. Yeah. Now, he wasn't saying Hinduism got it right. He wasn't right. saying Hinduism was prophetic. He was yeah. saying that, well, C.S. Lewis talked about the good dreams of the pagans. Yeah. What he was saying is that Christianity was the reality that Hinduism was trying to find. And in that sense, Christianity. But he objected to this completely. Yeah. Um, and I, I asked him, what, you know, what do you do with Paul citing a hymn to Zeus and applying it to God? Yeah. Right. And he didn't answer anything for a while, but then he gave, came up with a long essay to me that basically said, no, 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 that's not what he's doing. Except yeah. that was what he was doing. Yeah. So that, what was Paul saying? The things that you think you see in Zeus are actually found in God. Zeus is a shadow at best. The reality is found in God. Yeah. So Christianity is, in that sense, a fulfillment of what the pagan world was striving for. And we've talked about this in other contexts. You know, I, I did a lot on this uh, in some episodes with Norse mythology. Um, particularly the uh, the world tree, Yggdrasil, and how, how the early Christians used that. Um, that's the sort of thing that people have a hard time grasping, that by common grace, 
people can have a sense of what must be true and can be striving for it, yeah. even if they're doing it in ignorance of how you actually get there. Yeah. And, and there's always, you know, again, there's no, it's, there's no, no match for the incarnation here. It doesn't lead into, into grace. What it does is it points to it, even as it condemns the one that is both running towards it and running away from it. It holds us, as Paul says, accountable. In other words, if there isn't any law out there, right, engraved in some way on our moral natures, even in our fallenness, then what, what are we held accountable for in being violators of, of the law and covenant, right? If you have no knowledge whatsoever of what you're rebelling against, and this is why our very natures as creatures have to receive from God our being, what we are, and the fact that we are. But because we're fallen, we don't do it gratefully. But we're still receiving it as long as we're not trying to euthanize ourselves. And even that, we receive it enough to euthanize ourselves. So we have to recognize the gift character of our createdness and that we owe it to God on a fundamental spiritual level in order to rebel against it. <laughs> well, and that's, this that's is a, everyone a, and everywhere. <laughs> yeah, that's Paul's point, obviously, in Romans 1. Yeah, but the, the, right. the thing about but, it, it— but But, Chris, I think people take Romans 1 too far often. Um, so, you know, we talk about the noetic effects of the fall, the effects of the fall on our ability to reason and understand stuff. And that's real. Yeah. But it, what, it, what the noetic effects of the fall does not say is, therefore, we can know nothing. And, and this is interesting <laughs> but, but because... Let me, let me do, yeah, let me just say here quick, Tom. Uh -huh. But yeah, and, that, and, and then they miss the point that Tom made earlier, in other words, of accountability. Because you can only be uh, held, uh, uh, you know, as con someone who can be condemned if you know what you're rejecting. So there's there's a sense in which what Paul is saying is they know that's why they're under judgment. Um, but I, I also think that there's a, a lot of ignorance. Uh, many of the people that I actually interact with on these matters have never read any of the things that they say contain no truth. They just uh, are just, uh, they never actually, I, I've made this point many times. I would, I would be happy if people just read what Calvin read or yeah, Paul yeah. read. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and I, think, I think one of the things I was going to add is that we can't undo the metaphysics of creation, and we can't undo our own metaphysics. In other words, we can try to use operations to alter ourselves from male or female, and all. we don't undo the metaphysics of what we are. And this is part of what frustrates us, is we can't be God in some sense to choose for ourselves what we want to be. We owe it to the creation. Same with the meaning world is no matter how much we even try to run from God, we're still having to draw off the surplus of meaning that is founded in, stamped into the very creation. So even all of our attempts to do run away and rebel away from truth still will manifest some truth because we can't outrun it. And this is the thing. So on the one side, not everything the pagan does is, is, is all evil all the way down. There is truth that is a common grace that allows for some civilization and surviving and continuing the creation for God's redemptive purposes, right? Like, like the pagans were readying up a language, if you will, in Greek for us to have the New Testament to go into all the world because most people at that time were definitely not going to be speaking Hebrew. And so here, here you have a, a readying it. But on the flip side, even the attempts to reject creation and run from it. Even your Nietzscheans can still bear witness in spite of himself to profundities because he can't outrun the truth that he has to draw from and enact as a creature in God's meaningful creation. So um, back, back to Lewis and the good dreams of the pagans here. <laughs> um, what, what do we see? Um, it, it's it is actually his love of these myths that will ultimately be the key thing that's going to lead him to faith in Christ. Because he found 
meaning in a deep way in these stories. And it's interesting, you know, he he first becomes a theist, describing himself as the most reluctant convert in all of England. That was a conversion to theism. It wasn't a conversion to Christian theism. In some of his letters, I believe it was, he was talking about the, the obstacle to him becoming a Christian. He could understand, you know, intellectually the doctrines, but they didn't mean anything to him. It, you know, substitutionary atonement, sacrifice, all of these kinds of things, the incarnation, all of these things seemed meaningless. Like I said, he knew all the words, he understood them intellectually, but he didn't find any meaning in them. And it wasn't until his, well, his imagination was engaged that he found meaning. This is the famous conversation on Addison's walk with Tolkien and conversations with Hugo Dyson, where they say to him, you know, you, you look at you know, the myth of Balder and all of these other guys, and you found find them profound and deeply meaningful. You find the idea of sacrifice and self-sacrifice and all of these kinds of things really powerful and meaningful in the myths, but you don't in Christianity. What you need to understand is that Christianity is a myth like the other myths, and it has just as much meaning, but unlike the other myths, it's actually true. true. It yeah. really happened. Yeah. And it, it, was, it wasn't until they connected the doctrine to his imagination, to these things that moved him powerfully, that, he, that it cleared the weeds enough for him to become a Christian. This reminds me of Mortimer Adler's conversion. So Mortimer Adler, a Jew, uh, who was responsible for the great books program at the University of Chicago, um, became a Christian uh, through his reading of Aristotle and Thomas. So, but it was in a stepped pr a process like you just described for Lewis. First he becomes a theist and then he becomes a Christian. I think this is one of the things that annoys me a little bit about uh, some uh, understandings of apologetics. Some understandings of apologetics are so, uh, I guess, um, radical that you you don't actually have any room for this sort of stepped process. It's like the whole thing or nothing happens. Uh, but we have in these two instances, you know, evidence that the classical approach of first uh, coming to I believe that there is a creator and that uh, reality is ordered is the first step toward uh, salvation. In other words, salvation, you're not saved because you believe that there is a God. Uh, yeah. you're, you, you have to trust in Christ. So, But the first step is you have to even be open to the prospect that there is a God. <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's fine to make that the first order of business. Yeah, you know, one just as a case in point, one of my uh, my brothers came to faith in just that kind of process. Um, as a scientist, he didn't really see any need for God, but then when he was confronted with evidence for it in the form of Stephen Meyer's book, uh, "The Return of the God Hypothesis," that convinced him that there had to be a God. And from there, he went to actually Lewis, mere Christianity, to get to the idea of God as personal. And it was this step-by-step -step thing that, that ended up bringing him to faith. I personally like the story of Peter Hitch, Hitchin, <laughs> who, who was looking at art and, and the judgment see, scenes in art. <laughs> and it, he, it, it hit him one day. What if this is true? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and hopefully we're going to be with uh, Peter. We're working on it uh, when we're in Oxford. Uh, we've got some, we've got some feelers out there trying to get uh, Peter to come and talk to us. So hopefully that'll work out. But maybe it, we can make that the theme of the show if we can, if we can talk it, to him. It, it plays right in because what do you have going on in that artwork? But an invitation like the parables in Scripture, an invitation to perceive reality in a different way. 
And when you're able to invite it in this way, it addresses us more than merely just as angels or, or apes. It addresses everything about us, including that surplus about us that this level of imagination and perception tap into. And that's why this artwork spoke to what if this is true, right? That scene starting to do that. And Lewis will say this with all kinds of things. He will say, it's not, it, you will hear the divine riches of glory through a piece of music, but if you turn in to the music itself, rather than see it as this uh, the, theophantic vehicle for it, you're starting to miss the point. And he was so cognizant of that because of the empirical world that would look at this sound and try to measure it rather than to see what is created and communicated through it in the same way with a beautiful piece of of poetry or a story or a narrative or something that something is echoing from creation or the creator that is connecting with our transcendent yearnings and it is because of that that these richer levels of perception are be, are able to be communicated into. Yeah, I I, I want to just put in my I, I believe I've done this multiple times, but it's sort of obligatory, almost like slamming Rousseau. Um, I, I want to uh, point out to second amend, uh, second commandment absolutists that if that were if we followed through on their ideas, none of those paintings on, of the judgment would exist. Yeah. Because all of them feature Jesus. Yeah. And, and it, I, I, I'm with it, at least enough with the earlier uh, debates to say the incarnation, to wrestle through the significant importance to take the incarnation with uttermost seriousness demands that the creation be viewed in conformity to Christ sacramentally again and can be used in these ways. Um, Jesus does it first for us with the parable. What is a parable? It's the telling of this kind of story that we can all connect with and understand in a narrative form that is inviting us to perceive normal things in a strange way, you know, as Alice Milbank puts it, right? Yeah. And uh, this, is, this is what we're doing with the rest of creation. Well, and, and it's also what we do with scripture. Um, uh, Eric Auerbach, who was a, a yeah. great literary critic, wrote a book called Mimesis. And in that, he, he contrasted two stories. Uh, first essay in the book is called Odysseus's Scar. Hmm. And what you see in this story is, you know, Odysseus is disguised when he comes home. And the, one of the servants, an old serving lady, is going to um, wash his feet. And when she does this, she sees a scar on his thigh and she recognizes Odysseus because she was there when, that's, that, when he had the accident that caused that scar. But Homer then has to go off on this long discourse on how he got the scar. Okay. <laughs> then on the other hand, he tells the story, I believe it is of Abraham's sacrifice of Isaac. Yeah. No details. We have no idea what Abraham is thinking. We have no idea what's going on. You know, it, it, it's just this very bare bones narrative. And Auerbach's point is that literature is between these two poles, okay? I would add, though, that there's a theological point to be made with Abraham. There are actually two points. There is a theological point and an exegetical point. The theological point is Scripture is clear that only God knows the thoughts of, that a person has. You don't even actually understand your own heart. Only God knows what is really going on inside you. Okay, so you can't really talk about that in Scripture. But I would argue that on an exegetical level, there is a second thing going on here. And that is that God is inviting us into the story. He is inviting us to imaginatively enter the story and ask questions like, what was Abraham thinking? How how did he process all of this? What is Isaac thinking? You know, wh what what do, well, what does the scene look like? All of these kinds of, of questions, you know, this is actually at the root of some Ignatian uh meditations that, you know, where they ask you, put yourself in the story. What does what are you hearing? What are you seeing? What are you smelling? You know, all these kinds of things. Scripture invites us to do that by its its bare bones 
um, narrative style. Yeah. And that is, once again, God inviting us to imaginatively enter it, to use our imagination in connection with our understanding of the scriptures. So at my church, we celebrate the Lord's Supper every Sunday. Good. It's the very, uh, you know, sort of uh, finale. It's the apex that everything is building to. You are imaginatively entering into an upper room. In other words, it's not just uh, kind of a uh, uh, a thing that is located in our church building. There's a sense in which we're connecting. Uh, I would argue spiritually and really, but uh, also imaginatively. Uh, you think about even you know the Passover and the observance. Uh, everybody's supposed to dress a certain way. Uh, people are supposed to behave a certain way. Uh, you're sitting down for a meal, but you're actually dressed for the road. Uh, and, you know, it's all about kind of being ready to leave. And and notice what the Passover liturgy says. Uh, when the youngest person present asks, what, what, is the, what, what is different about this night? The answer is, we were slaves in Egypt, yeah, not right. our ancestors. We. We yeah. are participating, we're enacting in a very the, real way, participating yeah. Yeah. in the event of the Exodus. The yeah. same applies to the Lord's Supper. Yeah. And that's, uh, I, I mean, I think that's one of Hans Barsma's uh, best works is the one where I, I don't remember the title of it, but he tries to retrieve a lot of the, the participatory dimensions of our yeah. being there. Um, heavenly participation, participation. Is heavenly yeah, participation. through through the whole through the whole of Scripture and, and reading it the way the church has historically read it in that light, um, and that way that that is like a connectedness to the events that is far richer than the distance of trying to merely piece it together as some sort of external layer of what the evidence um, that we have historically available means you know, in terms of, you know, was, you know, how, how, in other words, if you can just reconstruct the original situation, but not participate in the events and the full narrative, you're, you're, you're missing so much of the richness. It doesn't mean the other part's not important because like Lewis said, it's a, it's myth made fact, right? It's a narrative um, that, that also comes down into our very living room and it happened at a particular time and in a tip, particular place but there is a connectedness to all of that in the spirit if you will um well and and if we think about it uh, in terms of god's perspective um god outside of time sees all things at once we are from god's point of view present in our ancestors when they when they act um so these things uh, this sort of linear uh, framework that we as human beings uh, are required to submit to uh, is instituted by God, but God is not subject to it. <laughs> yeah. And so, so for, from God's perspective, when we say we were there, it's it's not it's not as though our imagination is playing a game. It's right. it's an acknowledging a truth. Yeah. And, and I think this notion, uh, this strong notion, especially I think the medievals had it down, like you said, much better than, than we do, this notion of memory. And this is why liturgy and the repetitious nature of it and the participatory nature of it, um, the church calendar and the regular celebrations and you know, keeping, keeping before the memory these kinds of things, which go right to, like you say, scripture and, and its telling and telling us to continuously learn from, meditate upon, and make regular um, in, in our formation and orientation. And these things are key to also shaping the church's imagination. Yeah. So as we participate more, and as we reenact and remember, we also, from our point of place and time, start to contribute to that narrative, <laughs> and uh, that becomes Christian culture. You know, Carl Truman, um, I don't remember where this was, but he wrote a really, I think, important um, essay on, um, well, trans day of visibility. 
oh, uh, yeah. which yeah. was recognized was a, by the president on Easter. Yeah, that was the <laughs> first thing. He, he connect. Yeah, I thought it might be. He connected this to the sacrilege of a funeral for a transvestite. Um, excuse me, a trans. Um, prostitute that was held in St. Patrick's Cathedral, hmm. uh, where uh, he was declared um, Saint So and So, uh, the patron saint of whores. Hmm. Okay. Now, what 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 Truman pointed out, and the 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 the, the point here is this: what Truman pointed out is that in order to well, control a culture, there are two things you need to control, time and place. Yeah. And what's happening is we're moving past this enchantment into desecration. Yeah. Because what they are deliberately trying to do is take control of Christian sacred places and also Christian sacred days. They're replacing Christian holidays with with days celebrating perversion. Yeah. Well, and okay, and, and it's, not, it's not just that one day. And notice the lack of originality. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, just as all religion, even fallen religion, tries to mimic the rhythms of created order and meaning, but pervert them, right? Following mm -hmm. Satan who wants, who receives receives his satanic being, but wants to pervert it, not receive it, and define it his own way in reality too. So do they take the meaning structures of Christianity and need to borrow from them, right? And again, I understand there's an imitative nature to reality. But what the, the other side is this, that they can't muster up the creative capacity that Christianity can um, at least the pagan world had, in, even though it had its own perversions and distortions, it had elements of, 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 of developing culture and developing virtue and things, splendid vices. Um, and, you know, this is something very different than, than here. S sacrilegiousness and, and, and uh, a tearing at the sacred is, is more perverse. Sacrilegiousness, but also der uh, derivative to the, to the point of boredom. You know, yeah. the thing about Hollywood today is that nothing original is coming out of it. It's all uh, kind of rehash, but rehash serving a particular end. Yeah. So, you know, we take a story that was uh, uh, worth reading or worth watching, and now we just sort of move the characters around a bit. Uh, we make the, her the hero a heroine, or we turn the bad guy into a good guy. You know, those kinds of things. Um but there's nothing actually uh, generative, original, or interesting about any of this stuff. People people notice that um, there have been many many appeals to Christians to be better when it comes to things like telling stories. Um, unfortunately, uh, much of the la la second half of the 20th century was just es essentially the church doing a weird kind of. Uh, a pro, you know, sort of retelling of it's like everything was like secular in origin, and then we gave it a Jesus gloss. So, like, Chris, okay. that is that is my show next, so don't go too far uh, okay. into that. I, I'm right. serious. I'll, that, that I'll, I'll, the, stop, I'll stop right there. <laughs> that is the topic of the next show. So. Okay. <laughs> the, the reason why I brought up Truman's article is I think it's also a critique <laughs> of a lot of the church because. We don't colonize time. Yeah. We have the Lord's Day, and that's it if we're hardcore reformed. Maybe we've got Christmas and Easter, but we don't have Advent and Lent. Yeah. You know, we, we, we have given up, especially in the Protestant world, uh, conservative Protestant, reformed Protestant world, we have given up the calendar. Except the Lord's I, Day. We, we still have it, at my, but anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I know yeah. you're exactly oh. right. It doesn't do any work often when people still hold to it. You know, it, it really... And it, it, it helps, what does it do? It helps form our imagination. Yeah. The repetition, the liturgy, the, the annual cycles, all of these things retell the story of the gospel and help shape and form our imagination. If we don't control time, the culture will. 
Mm. That's a good point to end on there, Glenn. Um, we've come to the end of the show, <laughs> and I think that's a nice period. Anyway, uh, we're glad that you got to this point in the show because we want to talk to you about a couple of things. One of those things is the fact that we're going to the United Kingdom in like four or five weeks. It's, it's like coming up on us fast. By the time you get this show, it'll be like a month. Um, and uh, we're excited about it. There's a lot of things that are going to occur while we're there that we're really pleased about. One of those things is we've had a breakthrough. We're going to be at the Kilns. We're actually going to interview Michael Ward uh, in C.S. Lewis's home. And that's a lot of fun. But we learned from my daughter-in-law <laughs> that uh, C.S. Lewis would go out and take a little dip in the pond, uh, which is there at the Kilns. And uh, she suggested that we do that too. And I said, no, that would be like terrible. And, but then as we thought about it, I thought, well, if people want to support us Oh, I've got a pretty good Patreon, idea. And I'm not really sure I, I like it. <laughs> if people want to support us on Patreon, uh, and if, if someone's willing to give us $1,000, we'll make Tom take a, a dip in the pond. <laughs> $2,000. We'll I'm get all for Glenn. sprinkling type. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get Glenn in the pond. And five thousand dollars <laughs> will get me in the pot. <laughs> so, if you want to go to cumulative, in- Chris. <laughs> we we haven't discussed this. Is this cumulative. I'm making it if up. If it's as five thousand, do they get all three of us? <laughs> but if you go to if you go to our Indiegogo campaign and you pledge one thousand dollars for Tom or two thousand dollars for Glenn or five thousand dollars for me, you will get to see us go in the pond. How is How that? How come you get the 5000 <laughs> That's what I want to know. <laughs> well, that's why I have the microphone. <laughs> anyway, for, I'm for having 7, a 7000 you can get me out of having to go into the <laughs> <laughs> No one uh, will give that. <laughs> another thing we want to let folks know is we do have a, a Patreon account. We've got a number of people who faithfully give to us every month, and we are very grateful for that. If you'd like to join them, uh, we'd be grateful for for you to do that. But one of the things is we do a special show every once in a while for uh, the Patreon folks. And one of the things uh, we're asking for uh, is questions that folks want us to respond to. So if you want to, you know, go to our website and send us a question, uh, we will invite you to be a part of the Patreon account. And hopefully things will kind of go forward from there and you can be a part of that. Uh, conversation when three of us address the questions that people ask. Anyway, remember, Indiegogo, Tom, (laughs) (laughs) $1,000, Glenn, $2,000, and me, (laughs) $5,000. And uh, then, of course, there's also Patreon. Anyway, that's enough for now. (laughs) Bye-bye. (laughs) Bye-bye. The Theology Podcast is a ministry of Trinity Reformed Church in Huntsville, Alabama. To learn more about the church, you can visit trinityreformedkirk.com, trinityreformedkirk.com.